see you in a minute. <coughs> anyway, it's a pleasure to be here again and uh, thank my, my colleagues, the organizers. Uh, okay, uh, we're in the sort of in the midstream. Here's the title. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, weighted Hurwitz numbers and the connection with tau functions. The tau function will be a combinatorial generating function, not a generating function in the dynamical system sense, in a combinatorial sense. So it's going to appear as a formal series of the coefficients of the interesting objects. Those are the weighted Hurwitz numbers. Um, here's, since we're in the mid theme <coughs> of this week, I'm going to uh, very quickly, I just added this, this morning, uh, list various uses of tau functions, because uh, nobody has, I mean, everyone's <coughs> looked at some special thing. So, so okay, uh, what's familiar to many, many people is the connection with integrable dynamical systems, especially Hamiltonian systems, those are autonomous, and the role of the tau function, if I could put it this way, for the, I mean, most of you know this, it's sort of like Hamilton's principal function in canonical transformation theory, evaluated on the uh, on the leaves of the uh, uh, of the Lagrangian foliation. So it, it's a function only of the flow parameters. It's not exactly that, but it's sort of that. It's almost that. It plays about the same role. So that's the that's the uh, classical dynamical interpretation. Um, for non-autonomous systems, it's also generating function in the way that we saw for the panel day and various systems, but not quite so clear how it's related to transformations, but it's essentially a generating function for non-autonomous. So non isomonodromic systems are sort of non-autonomous, non um, as we saw, uh, deformations of isospectral systems. And that's how I met Craig, where that coincidence came up. <laughs> um, OK, uh, they appear in random processes. as. It, many here know, as <coughs> partition functions in various senses. It could be partition function in the sense of matrix integral. It could be a partition function for generating various types of random processes, like sure processes and so on. Integrable. So you, uh, there's always some dynamics. So there are parameters. You have to have parameters. There's not a function. And so under integrable deformations, whatever that means. Uh, fourth use is in quantum integrable systems where miraculous the, as many have observed, the, the tau function plays double duty, classical and quantum. And the way that, at least one way that it enters into the quantum is that it actually gives you solutions to the beta ansatz equations for quantum in the scattering method. And that the secret behind that is the so-called addition theorems, which sort of discretize the Hirota relations. And they are, uh, they can provide solutions to the, uh, the beta ansatz equation. So that's a connection with quantum. Now, the last one is what I'm going to talk about today. It's just purely as generating functions for various enumerative invariants of a geometrical or topological sort, such as what we've seen already, intersection numbers, Roman Whitman invariants, and what I'll talk about today is weighted numbers. So that's the, that's the placing of this particular talk in the context of many different uh, embodiments of tau functions. Okay. So here's the outline very quickly. I'll just remind, I'm not assuming everyone's familiar with what Hurwitz numbers are. I'll remind that and I'll remind you the old work of Okunkov and Okunkov. Okunkov? Which one? Okunkov, right? Okunkov. The Russians. I'm, just, I'm always told by my wife, put the accent one further than you think it is. And that's correct. Whatever you think it is. Anyhow, Kunko and they were the ones who first connected it up with KP theory and came up with a two total tau, tau, tau function, which was the generating function for simple, sim, uh, simple double or single coordinates. So uh, everything we're going to talk no, in, in the first half hour, everything, the first 25 minutes, everything I'll talk about will be generalization of the work of Okunko and Okunko and um, to democracy. They, they, they picked out the most likely branching, or the most likely, I'll describe the problem, factorization problem, in some generic sense, sort of like a dense stratum. But every other possible 
before which number exists, and there's no reason why those should be thrown out of consideration. So my version, or our version, which is joint work, I should say, to go back with, uh, with uh, Mathieu Guy Paquet and Sacha Arlo, um, uh, brings back democracy. It says, look, treat Hurvitz numbers, whatever they are, as random variables and give a probability rate. And, uh, it's, it's look, look at expectation values, if, if, if it's really a probability rate, uh, in which there's some probability of non-simple Hurwitz numbers and so on. Okay, um, the last part when I'm mentioning collaborative is the little bit that will correspond to topological recursion. I think I'll only have five minutes for that at the end, but uh, that's the subject of a 76 page paper which appeared in the archive three more weeks ago, so I refer you to that. Oh, uh, second part just gives a review of how you construct tau functions that are generating functions for these weighted Hurwitz numbers. And the third part gives a fermionic representation for all these guys, which is a good starting point for the, uh, the list of ingredients that go into topological recursion. I see topological recursion with all due apologies to the authors of the subject as a cuisine, a recipe, which requires this, 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 and this to be satisfied, and then puff you get uh, topological recursion. So first you have to go through your list of necessary ingredients, and the fermionic representation give a lot, it gives a lot of that. So I'll spend some time on that. Okay, so starting at the beginning, I'm not assuming anything. Well, I guess I'm assuming you know what a partition is. So first question, look at the symmetric group in n elements. How many ways can you take the identity <coughs> element and factorize it into k distinct factors where you specify the conjugacy class of each factor. So the conjugacy class is a partition. It's given by the cycle lengths. So how many ways can you do that? That's a number, which when multiplied by n factorial <coughs> is the combinatorial Hurwitz number. So it's a function of, OK, forget the mu. That shouldn't be there. It's a function of k partitions. And, it can, and there's a formula for it. I'll give you the formula in a minute. So there's nothing mysterious, but it's a heck of a difficult thing to calculate because you need to know all the in, in, invariant characters, all of the irreducible characters of the symmetric group to calculate it. So one goes to other methods. So I guess everyone knows what the Young diagram of a partition is. I'm not going to go over that. Here's the formula. For being a sure formula, the only ingredient is this guy. This is the irreducible character. There's a partition that appears in two places. Lambda tells you which irreducible representation it is, and mu tells you the conjugacy class on which the character is evaluated. You take a product of all the conjugacy classes for a fixed representation, you divide by normalization factor, which is essentially the stabilizer, that, the order of the stabilizer of that element. You multiply by another normalization factor, which is the hook product length. It's just a combinatorial thing that tells you the dimension of Representation. But basically, it's the product of the representations over the, over the conjugacy class summed over all partitions. That's the, the famous 19th century formula that tells you what this number is. <coughs> uh, there's another meaning which actually preceded it, and that's the original meaning due to Hurwitz, which is the same object. I'm calling it H here because it has a different definition, but the punchline is that the two numbers are the same, f and h. This enumerates branched covers of the Riemann sphere with k branch points in which the ramification profile of the branch points is given by, by uh, the partition. So it tells you how many sheets are collapsing into a single point to give you a ramification point. So this enumeration divided by the <coughs> order of the automorphism group of the branch cover gives you the same number. And, and the connection is, what everyone likes here, it's by monodromy. You, you take this guy, you, you take a branch cover, and you start taking a little stroll with your bicycle on the, on the base curve that lifts upstairs, and it gives you a product of um, symmetric group representations, which per permute the different ramification points of each branch point. So it's a very easy connection between the two. This is a Stupid illustration, which I copied off the net, which shouldn't be here. But this is an illustration of that sort of branch covering. It looks like it's three-sheeted 
with one branch point uh, collapsing to a single point. And, uh, and this is what would be an example of a simple ramification point. So two sheets are collapsing to one, and the other one isn't. If you look at the, uh, you look at the Riemann Horvitz formula, which tells you the genus, or rather the Euler characteristic, of the covering, it's what would be if it were unbranched minus the defect. And the defect is the sum of the degree of degeneration of each partition. And that's the difference the, called the co-length between the weight and the length. So the difference between the number of sheets and the actual number of ramification points added up, subtracted from two, and gives you the Euler characteristic. And if you do it for this diagram, you find that, <coughs> unfortunately, <coughs> do the calculation, the genus is a half. So <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not, a, uh, it's not an, an oriented thing. But OK, it's, it's just a bad, bad example, but it's easy to come up with a good example. OK, now here's a very nice thing. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a certain um, set of graphs which are, uh, well, some people call it the combinatorics, call them maps. They're called constellations. Anyone who's familiar with, where's Vonkin? Vonkin isn't here? <laughs> anyway, with his book, with Lando, knows what a constellation is. Uh, so it's a way to represent all of the details of a branch covering in a certain bipartite graph. Um, and all that we do is we're going to interpret the tau function that I, comes up soon as <coughs> just uh, a weighted version of constellations. The total weight added up over all constellations will be the tau function. Anyway, here's how it works. Take a generic non-branching point P, take all of the distinct points in the branch covering, Respond that, order, the, order that. Those will be some vertices. There will be n vertices in, the, in this uh, constellation. Then take the branch points, k of them, and take all the ramification points over those. So there will be several. Give a color to each of these guys. So red, blue, what, just to keep it. And so these are the colored points in the constellation. These are the, they're called star vertices. And you connect them up. You connect up. Uh, you know, so you, you put a color on this, and you put, let's say, no color on that, and you connect them up in a bipartite way in such a way that each color is connected only, is connected to a, a non-colored a non one. Uh, and, okay, whenever you have a closed curve in the base, it's going to lift to, a non, to, well, to some kind of path, in, uh, in the covering curve, and eventually it'll close up into a cycle. So that'll give you a way to, to uh, picture this. Uh, and you draw this bipartite graph with vertices of these two types, and connect up the edges, connect the two types. And uh, that basically describes. Sorry, that basically describes. Sorry? Sorry, I should stand here. Yeah. Yeah, all right. No, you're <laughs> Uh, that basically tells you how it, it, it's it's a more refined representation than the orbit numbers because the orbit numbers only look at the conjugacy classes. These actually give you the monodromies at each point, and the way that you do it is well. Let me look at the next one. You just look at a path. You start at one point, let's say B A. You go around your branch point, and, and it, it'll lift to something which will not necessarily go better same point, but if you do it often enough, eventually it'll close to form a cycle. And all of these p's will divide up into cycles, and that's your factorization of the identity element, because this is a non-branching point. So that's basically how <laughs> topologically, or whatever, in terms of monodromy, you reconstruct the data of the factorizations of the identity. But we're going to add later on. So here's a picture in which there's five sheets. Uh, I didn't distinguish it, but uh, this is in deference to Okunkov and Pandri Pandey. There are two guys which don't play the same role as the others. So let's think of that as a branch point over zero and a branch <coughs> point over infinity, and all the other ones are branch point, are finite branch points. It's 
atmosphere. And each one of them um, has got some kind of profile attached to it. And this diagram gives you the profile. So the color, let's say, zero here meets up with four, so that doesn't give you any. That's just the identity element. But it also meets up with five. That gives you nothing. Um, it also meets up with the sequence one, two, three, and that gives you the, or three, two, one, you do it in, a, in the uh, counterclockwise way. That single cycle gives you the, uh, the uh, factor corresponding to the zero branch point. And similarly for the, the fourth is infinity, uh, and if you look at that, the same diagram gives you one four, that's a single two cycle, and you have, in, in all, you've got five, five points, zero infinity plus three, so k is three plus two at zero infinity, and this diagram, you just go through it, just go through the sequence, and it tells you what the, uh, what the group elements are. So that's a way to make a graphical representation by constellations of of branched coverings. Okay, now, take the case where you only have simple branching. That means that the partitions are all 2, 1, 1, 1, 1. There's a pair of sheets that go inside and the others. Okay, so uh, the Hurwitz number for that looks like this, but we've got one, okay, this is primary bundle. We've got one privileged one, let's say zero. If I put a second one, u, that would be Okunko. Uh, that would be two privileged ones. So those are called simple, single, or double words. I think uh, Andre calls this uh, co coverings, number of coverings, but I'm using this notation. Okay, so from the Frobenius Schur formula, it's given by this. Here we have the same factor d times. d is the same as k, by the way, um, in this case, because the co length of every uh, simple branching is one. So the D, so when you're counting branch points, you're also counting the co-lengths. Um, and just define content sum just means you 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 put integers into the young diagram, zeros along the main diagonal, one above, one, minus one below, and so on. Add it all up, it's a arithmetic series, it gives you something quadratic in the parts of the partition. And that gives you uh, the value of the character, and that's what goes into the formula. So now, so this is what notation that Kalkunko uses. Here it's two, there are two of them. So we just leave two as anything, and then we take d of them, which are simple. Uh, equivalently, it's not very hard to see because it's all two cycles. It's the same thing as the number of steps in the Cayley graph generated by two cycles, by, by transpositions, the Cayley graph of Sn, which takes you from the conjugacy class mu to the conjugacy class mu. That's another way to interpret it combinatorially. It's all the same thing. Here's, okay, this is just pedantic, I, sh I should leave this up. Here's a, a, an example of the Cayley graph for S4 divided up not quite into conjugacy classes. This is the identity class. This is the uh, si uh, single uh, transpositions. This is the full cycles. And this is dumped together the threes and the two twos. OK, so we have a path along here. And what we're counting is starting at any conjugacy class, ending in any other conjugacy class. How many paths are there? And that's exactly what the uh, simple double Horvitz number um, measures. Okay, so here's Bakunkov and Pandari Pandey's generating function. You take sure functions, you know, every KP tau function can be developed in uh, basis of sure functions. The coefficients have to satisfy the Plicker relations, they have to uh, correspond to an element of some Grassmannian. And the, so these are actually Plicker coefficients, but there's something very special here. It's better to look at the 2D total one, where you have a double sure function extension, for those who are familiar. So 2D total tau functions, they also contain an integer. We don't need the integer, but they have two sets of KP flow parameters. And normally these guys are not equal. You have a sum over S lambda and over S mu. And the coefficient depends on both lambda and mu. It looks a little bit like Oleg's formula with a b mu lambda. 
but they are something very specific. They have to satisfy Plücker relations both in the mu's and in the lambdas. And uh, this is a very special case when it's diagonal, when, when all the off-diagonal values vanish. And it's easy to see that, that <coughs> the Plücker relations are satisfied if and only if the coefficients are of the, the following form, a, a so-called content product. So you, like, like in the case of, uh, okay, we're still talk, we're talking about uh, Okunko. So take the exponential function. Put in a small parameter that's going to be eventually for our topological recursion Planck's constant for the WKB expansion. But it's a small parameter, doesn't matter. It's just uh, introduced. And take the uh, exponentials of that multiplied by integers. That gives you a sequence of numbers, Rj. Put the numbers into the Young diagram, like content, so labeled by the j minus i. Forget the n here, you can take n equal to zero. So you have r, the exponential of the differences. And if you look at this product, this is exactly the exponential of the content sum that I had before. <clears throat> so you put that in as the coefficient, either for the single sure function or the double sure function expansion, and mirabilis dictu, this, these are tau functions. They satisfy the Hirota bilinear <coughs> equations, which, just in case you haven't seen them before, here's the, okay, here I've retained the integer. So uh, this is a residue form of the modified KP. So if you set n equal to zero on both of these, that's just the Hirota, uh, uh, <coughs> KP Hirota equation, that's zero. Um, the notation is just the usual one. Write it. It's an exponential sum, and uh, so you displace the tau function by two different parameters, and you set the residue at equal to zero. And that gives you identically the, the the bilinear, the tau function form of the, uh, of the uh, KP hierarchy. Same thing for the two D tota. I won't belabor it. There are two different equations. There are two different terms. One essentially involves a residue at zero, the other at infinity, and you have this bilinear form. So those two functions satisfy those bilinear relations, an infinite number of them. And this whole talk is about generalizing this by <clears throat> giving a more democratic weighting to the proofs. OK. So how do we do that? Int we introduce a function that replaces the exponential function of the previous slide. This could be a formal series, or it'll be something that starts with 1 and then has either a convergent or not a convergent power series. Uh, if this is not an infinite sum, but an infinite product, then you can recognize the coefficients as being the elementary symmetric functions in the coefficients of this product. And if you happen to choose the dual version, which is inverse minus, then the coefficients are the complete symmetric functions. For those familiar symmetric functions, this is the generating function for those two. So I'm going to think more often of this infinite product form. We'll forget about this for today. But this infinite or possibly finite product, because it could be a polynomial, rather than the infinite product, even though the exponential function doesn't come in that category. But you can recover Okunko's result just by taking the usual limit expression for the exponential function. So, uh, and it works. It gives you exactly the right rating, which, re which pulls out a simple, simple uh, branching. So here's the, the game. We're going to define a weight. We're going to define a weight associated to this infinite set of numbers ci, which, if any, anyone has read McDonald's book, they'll recognize that this is a variant on his formula for the monomial symmetric functions. There's, there's many bases for the ring of symmetric functions. One, the most basic one is the monomial symmetric function. It's not written exactly this way. Here I'm permuting the indices rather than permuting the powers. In McDonald's book, it's the other way around. The permutation acts on the powers. It gives the same thing with the normalization factor. The only thing is that this is 1 over k factorial, whereas if you wanted the monomial symmetric function, you'd write 1 over the automorphism of the partition whose parts are these coefficients. So it's just a normalization. It's essentially, this is the monomial symmetric function. You use that as the weight for the work surface. Of course, that's not one weight. It's an infinite parametric family of weights. So you can reproduce it. You can just fine tune it any way you like. So that you put more emphasis on one type of Corbis number or another. This is the dual version. We haven't talked about that. But 
uh, this, for those who are interested, who may I ask how many of you have read McDonald's book or at least know it passive? Three or four, okay. There is a famous, uh, there is a footnote in McDonald's book which says, nobody knows how to write the forgotten symmetric functions as a, an explicit polynomial sum. If I knew McDonald's address, I would send him a letter and tell him, here it is. But it's said in his book that this doesn't exist, it does exist. All you do is instead of having a strictly decreasing sequence which you, increasing sequence which you permute, you have a weakly increasing sequence which you permute, and you put in a sign in front of it, and that's the forgotten symmetric function. Now I'm just letting you know, you got 20 minutes left. Great. I'm at slide 21 and I had 43 slides, so that's okay. Uh, I'll speed up. Okay, define your content product formula using the following. The R's, which were exponentials in Elkin Code's case, are, evaluate, are evaluations of your, generate, your weight generating function at the same point, J theta. So if this is exponential, you get back. Take the content product of that, call it R lambda. This is just for uh, later on the fermionic representation. Uh, I don't want to get into this, but basically the R's, are each, R, each RJ is the ratio of two successive terms. So the rows are just the multiplication of these things from one upward or one downward. So the ratio of those two will come in when we have the fermionic representation. And just define this object. Define the series with a double diagonal Schur function and a content product coefficient. And for free, you've got a tau function because the rules tell you that. There's, it's clear when you write down the fermionic representation why this is a, a 2D total tau function at the n equals zero point. But anything with content product, no matter how you chose those RJ coefficients, will satisfy the derota Pylon equation. So we've, we've got a tau function here. The mirabilis dictu is, there's a famous formula. Did I forget to point out that formula? I forgot the famous formula. Anyway, I'm going to refer to it. There's a famous formula, which is the uh, uh, Frobenius character Frobenius Schuller character generating formula, which says that if you if you pass between the two bases for the ring of symmetric functions, consisting on the one hand of the Schuller functions, and on the other hand of the power sum symmetric functions, the coefficients of the trans of the uh, transformation matrix are the irreducible um, are the irreducible characters. So what, that's how you pass from one basis to another. So do it. Go from the basis of sure functions to the basis of power sum symmetric functions using the Frobenius character formula, brings in the characters, and do the calculation, which I did, and you get exactly the weighted Horvitz numbers that I defined before. So let's go back a moment. The weights where these guys, the monomial symmetric functions, we add up over every possible configuration with the same defect. So that means this is given, this is fixed genus. Fixing D is the same through the Riemann-Roch formula as, fig, as fixing the uh, genus of the covering. So we fix that. So D is the same as fixing the genus. So for each genus and each protected pair mu, nu, which doesn't have any weighting, and each generating function, there is a weighted average. It could be a probability weight or not, but it's a weighted, it's a weighted sum over the Horvitz numbers, and that's what I'm calling the weighted Horvitz number corresponding to generating function G. And this formula says that that 2D, that 2D total tau function is a generating function in the, in the sense of combinatorics, where the basis, these are just, there's hardly any difference between the P's and the T's. Remember that the <coughs> T's themselves, if you think of these as power sum symmetric functions. There it is. It doesn't really matter. Basically, the p's are the product of the parts, p mu 1, p mu 2, etc. And each p mu, each pj is a power sum. And it's a, that's the same thing as the pj up to a normalization j. So this is just simply monomials in the t's and monomials in the s's. 
This is the expansion. It's basically a multi tier expansion. Yeah, the coefficients are the. Simple. Excuse me? He's H. He, he is a simple and it's gamma. What is it? What is simple? H. So you have only two branch. I, I have a weighted average in which two mu nu are fixed and everything else is weighted, is, is summed over. Let me just go back to the. Uh, this is the definition of H. Okay. So this is the first main theorem that the tau function is a generating function for these objects. Okay, now I'm going to interpret it in terms of constellations. Uh, Ken, tell me when I have 10 minutes. Uh, you have 10 minutes left. I have 10 minutes left. <laughs> really? no. I have a number 24. Okay, anyway. Now I'm take joking. those constellations and start adding weights to the vertices and the, and the uh, edges. The weights we give to a colored uh, point in the constellation, which is a ramification point, is the inverse of beta, that small constant, and the constant cj. So the colors are labeling the different branch points that are weighted, and we give a weight of the inverse of that. For every, and now there are connections, there are edges relating the colored and the star vertices, and you give a weight to these edges, of beta cj. That, these are only the finite branch points. For the one at zero and infinity, you give a different weight. You give a weight of the power sum. This is the power sum. So it's basically the same thing as T mu j multiplied by mu j. You give a weight for each of these. And the same thing at infinity. That's the second set of power sum coefficients. Multiply it all together to give an overall weight to the, con to the constellation and add up over all constellations, and what do you get? The tau function. The tau function is just the weighted sum over all constellation with these weights. So that's a combinatorial interpretation of the tau function. OK, a couple of examples before I get to the fermionic part. I still have more than 10 minutes left? Yes. Great. OK, this is the, the first example. I'm not going to repeat it. We already went through it. This one, when you take as the weight generating function, just a 1 plus z, it only allows k equal to 1. It only allows the two protected branch points with mu nu as their profiles plus one more. k is equal to 1. So that's a very simple case. That's what's called Bailey curves. And lots of people, in particular Yonya, I guess, uh, has studied that from the viewpoint of generating functions. So that's a special case. If you do 1 over 1 minus z, uh, you get something which is rather similar. It has an arbitrary number of branch points, but the weight, if you calculate it, if you, the weight is just the <coughs> sign. It's just plus or minus 1. So everything is democratic, but the sign depends on the parity of the number of branch points. So that, and, and this one, I, I must, I, I didn't write down a formula, but the, the tau function for this case is something which is familiar and dear to everyone in random matrices. It's the Itzik-Sensuber integral where the two matrices, I'm going to write down the two matrices, A and B, you take their trace invariants, and those give you the Ti and Si Kp flow variables. And you take one over the size of the matrix, one over N, <coughs> and that's beta. You take that double, that double integral over, over the unitary matrices, I'm going to write down. And it's this. It's exactly what I wrote down. So that's a particular case. That's the case, well, the combinatorial interpretation in terms of Cayley graphs is it's enumerating all paths from one uh, conjugacy class to another, uh, which are weakly increasing in the sense that these are couples in which the second element is only going upward. So it's, it's, those, those are called weakly monotonic uh, orbits numbers. But it's the same thing as a signed enumeration of branch numbers. Okay. Oh, yes, I did. Okay, here it is. This is the integral I was talking about. So think of the t's and i's as just the trace invariants of, of a and b. And of course, this is the familiar formula going back to what, Paris Chandra or somebody. Uh, yeah, Paris Chandra. And the beta parameters. Were and there is, of course, trace a before b. There's what? Is there a trace missing? No, no, no. It's the first formula for, ty for types, right? Times, yeah, trace. Oh, oh, I see. Yes, that's that's i, a to the power i. Thank you, and b to the power i. Okay, so I'm not going to say more about that. 
It's a fermion. It's ten to one. Great. Five minutes for fermions, five minutes for topological recursion. So the fermionic uh, Fox space, you have creation of annihilation operators, it's really an exterior algebra generated by some basis, uh, which is orthonormal. So uh, as in the previous talk, the creation operators are exterior product with the basis elements and the annihilation operators are interior product with the dual basis. It's exactly the same as uh, fermionic constructions. And the vacuum is the wedge product. It's the semi-infinite wedge products of all the basis elements going from uh, minus 1, minus 2, etc. It's the field Dirac C. OK. So here we have two abelian groups which act fermionically by uh, this Clifford representation. I'm not going to define exactly what this is. These are called the currents. They're bilinears in the, in the uh, creation and annihilation operators. And the fermionic representation of a 2D total tau function is, in general, you put any group element here, where the group element could be the exponential of any bilinears in the creation and annihilation operators, you put in one abelian flow and another abelian flow. These two guys together um, don't commute. They, they form a Heisenberg algebra. But uh, those are the two flow variables. And any 2D tota tau function is representable fermionically in this way. So that, that, uh, that, that's, and the particular case which gives the types of tau functions that we were looking at, which have a name, go back. The type of tau function we were looking at, where everything is, everything is diagonal in the Schur function, everything is diagonal. Why? Because um, the group acts diagonally. And these things, where it's, it acts diagonally on the Fermi Fox space, every basis element is an eigenvector. And these are just the eigenvalues of that group element. So there's a particular, I'm not going to go through it, but there's a particular family, a abelian, infinite abelian group, uh, whose eigenvalues on the basis elements are these. Well, um, yeah. So, uh, so that's why this is a tau function. <coughs> OK. Um, so I went through these examples already. We have the Fermi equation, annihilation operators. Uh, I'll give the fermionic representation of these gamma. My, well, here it is. Uh, the C row, the group element in the middle, is of this form. Notice psi i, psi i, dagger, normal ordered. So it's diagonal. It acts diagonal. And, and that's it. And any tau function of that diagonal form was called many years ago, I'm not sure who first used the expression, tau function of hypergeometric type. Um, I, it's impossible to give the right. I, I think that, that Sasha Orloff first called it hypergeometric type, but it did appear in the works of Sasha Orloff, <coughs> Miranov, Morozov, and some previous three people. Oh, they the pair of OK. Anyway, uh, it, it did appear before. But anyway, that's a special kind of tau function, a hypergeometric type. And basically, the statement is that just by how you choose the parameters, I mean, whether you call, call the TIs, the independent variables, or the CIs, it doesn't matter. It's an infinite number of parameters. Uh, these always are hypergeometric tau functions. And so already a couple of years ago, every known example of a generating function for weighted Horvitz numbers, including the work of Fiona and uh, Snowgraph and I don't know how many others, were all special cases. Right? So the only thing here is that this unifies it in a general setting. Hypergeometric tau functions are the generating function for weighted Horvitz numbers. OK, here's the Baker function. This is for, do I have five minutes left? I'm just about getting to the topological recursion. The Baker function has this representation in terms of here's the group element and here's the uh, this is, there's, there's a creation operator, an operator, 
That tells you the point at which it's evaluated. That's the dual Baker function. For those who are not familiar with this, you're not going to learn it now. We saw this in the previous uh, talk, except this is single component, whereas what we were looking at in the previous talk was multi-component. Uh, this is a, OK, I'm not going to go through this. There's a natural basis, which is obtained by taking the monomials zi, thinking of that as a basis for the underlying Hilbert space, and then dressing it, dressing it with a group element. That gives you a sequence of, of uh, basis states, positive and negative k's. I think the positive k's give you the element of the Grassmannian. There's a sequence, I can't do it in this time, but there's a sequence of recursion operators that relate these guys. Um, so the recursion operator is defined by evaluating the generating function for weights on the Euler operator. X, D is the Euler operator. And when you see x appearing here, it's the inverse of the spectral term. 1 over z is x. So you've got these recursion relations. And this is the beginning of topological recursion. It's easy to see that the zeroth element, which is the same thing, as the, Baker element, as the Baker function evaluated at t equal to 0, satisfies this differential equation. So I didn't say what s was. s is in terms of the second flow variables, is this infinite sequence. If this is a polynomial, then that's a polynomial in the, uh, yeah. If g is a polynomial and s is a polynomial, then this is a polynomial in the Euler operator. So it's a finite order differential equation. And that is the quantum spectral curve, and it's dual. If you go to the classical limit where you replace the Euler operator by the product of two conjugate variables, x and y, two canonical conjugate variables, then this is the spectral curve. x, y is this function <coughs> s of gamma x times the <coughs> generating function value at x, y. If g is a polynomial and s is a polynomial, this is a rational curve. But in general, it could be different. Something else. So this also holds for the Elkin-Cove case, in which case you get the Lambert curve. Okay. Uh, here is the list. I'm going through the list of uh, kitchen ingredients that go into the stew of topological recursion. So, excuse me for speaking so disrespectfully. But <laughs> um, so you need a spectral curve. You need a classical and quantum spectral curve. We have it. You need the two-point correlators, which are uh, also interpretable in terms of the uh, baker linear differential. That's the first term in the topological recursion. And that's obtained by evaluating the tau function at, two, at the difference between two translated points. The square bracket here means the, the, the powers, the powers of the underlying uh, parameter, x. So it's components of that are x, x squared over 2, x cubed over 3, etc. And this is the paracorrelator. Um, OK, I, I don't have time to do all this, but in the case where s and g are both polynomials, we can give an, an expression for the uh, paracorrelator, uh, which is like a simple kernel, what we've been seeing, a finite sum in the numerator with an x minus x prime in the denominator. And the sum is over these basis elements, where the matrix, which is the size Lm, where L and M are the degrees of the polynomial S and G. So this is the uh, finite kind of Christoffel Darboux type expression for the integral kernel that enters. Um, there's something else which is important, which is the so-called current generator. This is the thing that is used rather than the tau function in the topological recursion approach to generating functions. It's, it's really a generating function of fixed genus. So this is the interesting object. You have the same weighted Horvitz numbers appearing. The tilde here just means connected. I didn't distinguish between connected and non-connected. The usual combinatorial tricks tell you that if you replace the tau function by its log in all these definitions, you get the connected version. That's what the tilde means. You apply a product of these first order derivative operators, defined this way to the tau function evaluated at t equal to 0. That gives you a function of n points. And these are the guys that will be subject to the topological recursion relations, more or less. To be more precise, we, we take the multiple derivative of these guys with respect to all the variables. That is representable as a multi-current. So the fermionic interpretation of this is you take the product of these. I have two minutes left? Or zero. I have one minute left. OK. So you take, OK. 
This is the object of interest. And now I'm just going to display, okay, there's, there's a question of local, global, the Ws are defined on, on the base curve. There's something, we have a rational parameterization, so we have a Z, a function Z, which is a global parameter on, in the rational case. And so we have to multiply them by the product of the derivatives to normalize it to get the famous thing that enters in the topological recursion. So we give that as the definition. And here are the equations. So these are the equations which appear over and over and over again, uh, which determine W tilde GN, which remember is an alternative generating function for the local positions, um, in terms of the lower order terms by looking at certain residues. So, so uh, everything is defined in this formula, but you can see it's linear and quadratic terms, so the recursions are linear and quadratic, and it gives you a, a lattice, a two-dimensional lattice, where you can build up from the 0, 1, and 0, 2. So genus 0, 1 point, genus 0, 2 point. The genus 0, 1 point is just the, uh, uh, is what? Is the, the meromorphic differential that we always have with spectral curves, uh, y dx. And the 0, 2 is the, uh, uh, the, uh, is the uh, uh, quadratic differential. And from those two guys, this allows you to build up all of them and then go ahead and see if it takes you less or more time to compute the coefficients from this scheme, which is a finite recursive scheme, or just going right back to the Frobenius formula. Uh, I believe this is faster, but anyway, this is what topological recursion gives you. Okay, a few references. This was, the last bit was joint work with Bertrand Hénard, Guillaume Chapuis, and Sasha Alexandrov. The earlier work was uh, together with uh, Mathieu Guitaquet and Orlov. And, uh, okay, this is the Oakham cover uh, reference. A few review articles. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Time for a question. Diagrammatic representation. Well, those constellations, those weighted constellations, are diagrammatic representations of every hypergeometric tau function. So you could particularize those with the weights. Weights. Uh, it's a limiting case. So uh, yes, you, uh, the the weighted constellation is a diagrammatic representation of the Itzikson Zuber. If you choose, it's a limiting case. Uh, if you choose the CJs in the limit to be something like one over m, you, you take one over take one plus z over m to the power m limit as n goes to infinity, and that gives you the exponential function. So, so you have a finite approximation in terms of polynomials, and so you, it's really an infinite limit of uh, these constellation diagrams. But it's a diagram. So, um, okay. One well, last question. Okay. Uh -huh. Good question. So, so the 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 the, the, the of uh, the So you have the, the weighted Mulvitz number with uh, small simple branch point except two. Yeah. And you use the integrable system to effectively calculate uh, this number. So yeah. you use the tau function to calculate. They are being calculated explicitly. So this number. But my understanding is that the generic case of a Mulvitz number with any, any, any partition is open from the calculate that. Can you choose your weight in such a way that you can calculate this number? I'm not quite sure about open, uh, how to calculate them. There's a formula which gives you the Yeah, if you function. want the number, when, Just, when you go to very Yeah, but okay, Okumkov's case also. Uh, okay, you have, no, no, Okumkov's case is not the it's just No, but there may be papers where this number has been calculated explicitly. No, it's an infinite so series with content, with exponential content product coefficients. That's all. Yeah, yeah, but the, the it's no more explicit than, than yeah, the other cases. Yeah, but they have been calculated explicitly. So, okay. There are other ways, but I'm talking about, okay. So you have the tau function, that's a generating function, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you go about, in practical terms, getting the coefficients out? Yeah. So, uh, topological recursion is one way to do it. That's been applied to open coast case. It's not very efficient, but it works. You can get it as a finite recursion. You can also, 
course, use the covariance formula directly. Um, and it's possible. I mean, we've taken it for, we, we've got the topological recursion equations, which are no more complicated than the Okunkov case, for the case where the generating functions are polynomial and where the second set of covariables is only a finite number of them. In general, the quantum spectral curve will be infinite order or a finite difference. So it, exactly what you can do with that is, uh, well, each case is, is more complicated. But it's some kind of limiting case of that. Um, I don't know what explicit means more than, uh, than what was done in the Oakham Cup case. But, uh, the, 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 the existence of the generating function is general. The formula is completely general. And the practical calculation of the coefficients can be done in a finite way using our spectral curve, just like you can do it for the Oakham case. In fact, in some sense, ours is easier because it's a rational curve. It's a finite order differential equation, whereas the Oakham Cup it's the Lambert curve, and, and it's a difference equation. I mean, it's a, it's, and it's, the curve is transcendental. So, okay, you know, what's easier? So with my apologies for interrupting, I, I, uh, great lectures call for much conversation, which maybe we should have uh, at dinner. So we can move on to the next talk. But first, let's thank John again.